My name is Paige Peterson. I do communications and uh, I kind of was doing web development for MadeSafe, but I'm going to focus more on the communication stuff as of now. Um, my background is, um, I, I guess, relevant background is just being interested in decentralized technology. I previously worked for a startup called Open Garden that was working on uh, uh, mesh networking between smartphones and laptops. Um, I, left, I left the company about a year and a half ago and started working for MadeSafe. And originally, uh, David Irvine, the founder, was going to come along as well to Battle Mesh. However, he got held up in the office uh, fixing some uh, code and um, couldn't make it. However, we're going to try to dial him in at the end uh, for the last half an hour so we can have a discussion with him and he can kind of answer the questions so I don't have to. Um, <laughs> so. I'll just do, I'm just going to do like an intro of what it is, try to go over the stack as fast as I can and some aspects of it and then um, and kind of like tell a little bit about our history because it's also interesting. So uh, MadeSafe stands for Massive Array of Internet Disks, Secure Access for Everyone and it's essentially a network that's trying to replace the current dependency on servers. So. Um, and it will be focusing on initially storage and communications, so storage of data and communicating between peers. And um, we've kind of built our own stack to, um, to enable all of this. And it's gone through a lot of changes, but I guess I'll get into that at the end. So it's completely serverless. Um, it's cryptographically secured. and. I guess I should say that the, the main goal of it is to build in security and privacy from the start so that everyone using it, all of the uh, applications on top, are inherently secure. So um, with this, it'll be, it'll be um, basically a framework for developers to build applications on top of. MadeSafe will build some of those, um, at least from the start, and then, you know, hopefully uh, we'll get a bunch of other developers interested in uh, building applications where they can just have inherent security and decentralize their users' data. So the network itself is completely autonomous. There's no central point of control. It makes use of the fact that people turn on and off their computers all the time and kind of adds that to the security. Um, so it's essentially a network made up of peers where individuals install a node on their home computer or you know a Raspberry Pi or whatever they want, and it'll be those nodes will be storing uh, encrypted chunks of data uh, owned by however the uh, public key infrastructure dictates it. So if you want a piece of data to be completely private and only you have access to it, that's uh, very doable. Same with privately shared data or completely public data. And we have implemented a token mechanization to kind of enable individuals to be okay with storing other people's data on their computers. So, um, and sort of alleviates the problem where someone might try to take advantage and upload as much data as they want to the network while not uh, supplying any resources themselves. So, um, that that's we're calling that a proof of resource uh, mechanism, and it'll essentially work such that if someone's able to successfully get their data from your node, then you're entered in this lottery to get this token. And in order to put new data to the network, you, you will be required this token um, to save new data. So 
We, I think it naturally aligns with mesh networking because there is this, uh, you know, this need in the mesh networking community for security. And um, likewise, or contrarily, the net, uh, made safe network or the safe network needs reliable ways to, for their users to access the network. So it can be sort of this codependent type system and we're really interested in creating a sensorless internet um, because you know all of the data on the network is encrypted and um, goes through this routing mechanism that puts the data uh, spreads the data out as far as possible um, it is essentially this global internet and it's built to be um, sustainable at uh, a large scale not to say that there can't necessarily in the future be some way to modify um, some sort of way to do local services, but that would be kind of a plug-in or completely separate. Um, but the security comes in this routing and being able to disperse data as far as possible. And um, it also benefits mesh networking because, you know, in the various communities like Freifunk, you have to set up servers in different countries to access different content. And if you were to be using this global secured network, you wouldn't need to you know, depend on these other servers to access the content if it was just on this network that's not based on location. So um, this is perhaps. Okay, so this is the stack. Um, we sit on top of IP and um, our, our lowest layer is called crust. And that basically enables individuals to, or nodes to connect to the routing layer above it. It kind of separates the IP aspect and um, just manages connections to the routing layer above. Um, it's basically enabled by a bootstrap file where you have seed nodes and you can, um, it tries to collect as many seed nodes as possible and uh, re uh, reconnects to, um, when you're reconnecting to the network, it will use previously connected nodes and um, it will remove nodes that aren't successful um, and everything between uh, crust and routing is encrypted. So. Um, there's not really a way for man in the middle to happen at this point. <laughs> um, and so it's essentially, um, crust is kind of like a two layer thing in itself. Uh, it's taking in all of the different protocols, so TCP, uh, like an RUDP or any sort of network, um, actually I think I have, so yeah, this is Crest. So um, you'll be able to kind of connect into any, any network, but we're making this, you know, so you can connect to the routing protocol that MadeSafe has optimized for security. Uh, but essentially you could use this, this layer to connect to any peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. Yeah, and so it just generally manages the connections. And it uses, um, it can also, it, you, right now it uses, um, like if you're on a local network, it'll use a beacon, but we're also hoping to implement a gossip protocol so it's easy to discover new, uh, new seed nodes, new nodes to connect to the network. And by the way, if, yeah, so because David's gonna be calling in, um, just hold questions and stuff until that, because. He'll have probably way better answers than me. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it, keeps, uh, it keeps checking for new routes to, um, to the network to kind of sustain itself and make sure that it's not uh, depending on too little nodes. And so I guess I'll jump into the layer on top of that, which is the routing and Sentinel, perhaps, there we go. So we don't have a cool diagram for this yet, but um, that'll come. <laughs> we, 
we really need it because it's like the coolest part of the network and um, and it would be a lot easier to explain. I tried to start putting something together, but it wasn't going to happen until for for this presentation. But perhaps I could keep working on it and show you guys later. Um, so. The routing is based on a modified Kademlia DHT with a public key infrastructure baked in, and so that creates a like a DHT uh, public key infrastructure, which basically creates the namespace for everything. So um, for content and nodes, um, they content and nodes have their have separate namespaces, but because they have a similar, uh, the same sort of ID infrastructure, you can still relate them in between because they have the same uh, same IDs. And um, in order to add the security, we use the XOR distance between nodes for authority. So. Um, Essentially, I'll, I'll show you kind of the, the language. So, yeah, that dictates the language. So, essentially, in addition to storing data in these encrypted chunks of data, all the nodes are required um, as a part of being the network to take on these personas or roles. And um, they can switch in between these roles um, depending on what they need to, need to do. And um, the kind of the trigger to uh, to switch in between roles is based on the nodes that are talking to them, sending them messages. So if they get a, a message from a node that's a client, um, they'll know that they need to be a client manager in that instance. And it's also based on the sort of uh, data that's being passed in between. And um, to, uh, to kind of prevent anyone from setting up a node and you know, sending um, any random message and trying to um, you know, attack a node or surround a node, we use a group consensus. So for each step in the process, many nodes are coming to consensus about moving forward. So um, with that, um, this is kind of one example of putting a, piece, a new piece of data to the network. So you start with the client, and the client sends a message to his own address in the network. And the client managers, which are the, uh, the nodes that are closest in XOR space to the, to the client, um, they receive this message and you know check check the the message type and that it's a client and also that he has avail available storage so that's where the the token comes in if if uh, this node is not um, contributing any resource and they want to put new data they're going to need this token to uh, put the new data so if they don't have the the resources or the token then they won't be able to put new data uh, but if they do, and they should, they um, send the they send the data to the data managers, which are the um, which are nodes that are closest to next source space to the ID of the data itself. And um, so, yeah, again, this process of checking for authority and then kind of coming to consensus about uh, moving to the next step happens. And, um, you know, if the, in this instance, if the data is already on the network, it doesn't put it again because that would be redundant, too redundant and um, unnecessary. Um, and then so data managers will send to the PMAN manager, which is are basically nodes that are responsible for the storage nodes, which are the PMAN nodes. So they're basically constantly checking um, to see that the nodes online and that they're able to that someone's able to get uh, get data from them. And um, once they you know this authority process happens again, and then they send the the chunk of data to be stored in the final node. 
And all of these relationships are based, again, on the XOR distance. So that's kind of a, a brief overview, and that, that can happen with any sort of uh, data type in the network. This is just you know, saving a piece of content to the network. And then, um, so back to this. Uh, so essentially, it's CREST routing. Sentinel is kind of the, the language of the network that I was just talking about. And then the vaults are the nodes that are storing data and taking on these persona roles within the network. And then separa uh, separate but um, also considered nodes on the network are the client nodes, and that's kind of the interface for, for the users. So when someone sets up a client node, they're, it's an, uh, an interface for their node to, that's essentially the initial node that we are talking about in the, the language of the previous slide, the client right there. The client up there is the client node, the managed node is one of the vaults. And so there's a bunch of things happening in the client, um, but essentially that just handles all of the, the client side, uh, client side encryption, authentication. Um, it's, uh, it handles messaging. It basically, so you don't necessarily, you don't need to trust anything on the network. Everything is done sort of um, client side and it enables this is where it enables also for uh, exposing an API for developers to build on top of and encrypt data and go straight in. Um, so I did, so again, you can, you can store public or private data um, with uh, all data that's stored to the network. It goes through this self-encryption process, which looks like this. Um, and it essentially takes the chunk, it splits the data into chunks, takes the, um, uh, the hash of the chunks, the chunks on each side and creates this encrypted chunk and outputs it. It outputs all of these encrypted chunks plus a data map. So the data map is what you need to store and what the, the um, what the, uh, you know, the clients and the, the accounts on the network will need to store securely. So this on its own is a cool thing, but the data map is how you're gonna put everything together. So you need to store that, uh, store that very securely as well. So in the end, we have multiple layers of encryption and security. Uh, many people have said that it's too much, but we don't think so. Um, let's see. Yeah, so this is uh, a list. I'll put this, um, this slide, up, slide deck up on the Battle Mesh website, but these are technical explanations of all of uh, the crust routing Sentinel and Vault aspects done by David on a whiteboard. So that might be interesting for a lot of you. Um, and it definitely helped me they helped me kind of understand a lot because there is a lot of aspects to this network. And, um, but he definitely does best with a whiteboard and it's very clear. And so the history is, is interesting as well. So uh, MateSafe was technically founded in 2006 and uh, with a lot of research and development in the first many first several years, and um, kind of just you know funded by family and friends to sustain a, a small group of researchers, and um, you know ended up refactoring and kind of minimizing the complexity over time. And um, last year. So fast forward to last year, we did this crowdfund thing where we um, essentially set aside 10% of these tokens that are gonna be used for the network and let people give us Bitcoin. And uh, we essentially gave them a proxy token which will be traded one for one for these tokens when the network is live. So that was how we were able to sustain ourselves until now and until uh, probably into next year. Um, so we're 
we're completely crowdfunded. We don't um, have any VC investment or anything. And um, I guess a really interesting thing can, uh, is it? Yeah. Uh, RFCs? Yeah. Uh, it's it's for everyone to participate. So it's for the RFCs are for. Um, okay, it's internal, but it's external because we want uh, outside developers as well. Anyone can comment and uh, participate in the RFCs. But uh, so, what's really interesting uh, this year, uh, David took the leap and decided to throw away all of the C++ code that everything uh, that had been in development for the last uh, three or four years and rewrite everything into Rust. So um, there's a lot of benefits to Rust and um, maybe we, you can talk to me individually about that after, but Rust has turned out to be a really huge benefit for us. Um, it's only taken several months for us to re-implement the entire C++ library. We're kind of finishing that up right now. Um, but there's, uh, it enabled a lot of great things, including uh, front-end developers that were working for MadeSafe to start working on the core, um, and um, really just to uh, you know, make sure that it's more secure. So if you don't know, Rust has internal testing and it basically doesn't let you write bad code and it'll tell you if you are. So uh, we're really excited about Rust and we're reaching out uh, a lot into the Rust uh, community. However, we are one of the first uh, kind of all in on Rust uh, uh, Infrastructures. There's a couple companies that are using it for a few things, but we are we are using it 100%, and um, we're really excited about that. We've kind of been able because of that we've been able to sort of maintain a relationship with the core developers and help them and them help us. So in addition to uh, this uh, Rust switch, we also implemented a, a code bounty system. So if you want to learn Rust or play around with Rust and help us maintain the, the code, we don't want to be uh, the core maintain, we don't want to be this like group of, uh, this one company that's maintaining the core. We want as many contributors as possible. And for that, we're willing to pay out in Bitcoin based on how many points and um, you know, how much time you spent on, on a, a bug or a feature. And that's linked to our RFCs, so you can see our RFCs on, um, on our GitHub. They're publicly available. And that's, there's actually been a, several huge changes since implementing that system a couple months ago. So it's been really beneficial. And people, I encourage everyone to kind of go into there and um, give opinions and support because you might uh, help kind of modify the network. And, um, so uh, I guess finally, we are completely open source, open development. You can keep track of everything that we're doing. Um, we post weekly updates to our community forum and, um, and all of our code is GPL3. So, um, So not the whole system, no. There's, so there's patents on a couple of things to uh, essentially pre prevent, uh, uh, prevent uh, other larger companies from taking it. But the benefit of GPL3 is that the patents can't be enforced on anyone that is uh, using our code because of the GPL. So it's really only for people that are not using GPL. And then in that case, they're breaking the license anyway. But it applies to rewrites as well, obviously. Yeah. 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 That's, oh. that's specific to GPL v3. That's, that's one of the main reasons why yeah. we went with that. And we are doing as much as we possibly can to kind of mitigate anything that we could possibly do with, you know, patents because we don't, we obviously don't want this to be uh, 
Well, maybe not obvious to you yet, but we don't want this to be a thing where we're making money. We're not interested in uh, selling this. And we actually really can't, we couldn't really sell the whole thing because there is one library, the, um, the uh, self-authentication library. It's, uh, that is, uh, um, that, that can't really be sold because it's strictly, uh, it's strictly GPL, but, oh shit, that's not the last slide, is it? Show that again. All right, um, and s what time is it? <laughs> Sorry? OK, so OK, half past, so that's a good time. Um, so these are other links. Um, so our GitHub uh, at Listen is where we keep track of all of our issues and um, our updates. So if you want to see what we're working on, you go straight to the at Listen. And then if you want to look at our crates, which is the um, kind of the central repo for all of the Rust, um, Rust libraries, you can check those out there. and. Um, community forum and then company website.